Next, we have Dr. Christopher Shields, a neurosurgeon with the Norton Neuroscience Institute. He earned his medical degree from the University of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. He completed his internship at St. Michael's Hospital University at the University of Toronto and his residency at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. Dr. Shields then completed a fellowship in microvascular neurosurgery at the University of Vermont in Burlington. He is board certified by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, American Board of Neurological Surgery, and several other professional and medical associations. He is also the reason the Norton Neuroscience Institute is what it is today. And I have to also say he is a great, great, and has been the inspiration for why the Memory Center is even in existence. So please help me give a very warm welcome to Dr. Chris Shields. I just have to keep up your rapid pace, Stephanie. That's my job here. But thank you very much for that kind of introduction. I appreciate it very much. And I'd like to point out to you some of the things that Dr. Barve referred to earlier. And we're going to talk generally about why we sleep, the risks of sleep deprivation, and a little bit about the science of sleep and the mechanisms of sleep and how to improve sleep patterns. How do you get a better night's sleep? Well, why do we sleep? Well, the frivolous answer to that question is because we're tired. Well, of course, we sleep because we're tired, but there are many more important reasons than that. One is that it does confer many health benefits, and it gives full time for faulty cell repair, both during the day and during the night. But perhaps more important than that, is that it establishes new memory and learning processes. For the first four hours of a full night's sleep, one retains what they've learned for the previous day. When you learn things the previous day, that goes into the hippocampus, the source of short-term memory. And so that night, that short-term memory is transferred by very rapid impulses going from the hippocampus to the cerebral cortex where it's encoded into long-term memory. For the last four hours of sleep, of an eight hours night sleep, that's the point at which new ideas, innovation, curiosity, uh, development of new concepts in the world take place. So that you can learn what you've learned from the previous day by the first four hours of sleep, but perhaps more important than that is living the full Eight or sleep in the full eight hours, which allows you to really development and conceptualize new ideas. What are the requirements of sleep? Well, this changes enormously over the lifespan with uh, a newborn, which seems to be up for mostly feeding and being cleaned and washed and bathed. Uh, they sleep between 14 and 17 hours. When you get to the teenage, years, you have eight and a half to nine and a half hours sleep. And as an adult, it's critically important to sleep somewhere between seven and nine hours per night. And we see the effect of loss of sleep. This is from high school a period of time during sports injuries. And if one looks at the percent chance of injury, it's 70% during the high school years of sports with six hours sleep. If one sleeps seven hours, that drops off. So that with nine hours sleep in these high school students, it's down as low as 15%. So there's a direct effect on the safety of people by sleeping a full eight to nine hours per night. This is also shown in sleep loss in car crashes. In, if you don't sleep, or if you sleep less than four hours a night, you have a 12 times greater chance of being involved in an automobile accident. If you sleep only four to five hours, it's over four times greater. And with six to seven hours sleep, it's one with eight hours being the uh, one, the furthest to the left side. So you see that when you're tired, 
you're at real risk, not only of injury, but survival. So sleep is controlled by two processes. And I'll get into a little bit of the science here, which is really quite fascinating and has really been developing over the last few years. There are two main sources of the need to sleep, and one is the circadian oscillation with cycles occurring during the solar day. That is when it gets dark, you get tireder. As it gets light in the morning at seven in the morning, the light is there and you wake up. There's a, basically the exposure to sunlight is what triggers off the circadian oscillation. And this is controlled by a mere 20,000 small number of cells in the hypothalamus in an area called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The second area is sleep homeostasis, which is regulated by the accumulation of adenosine. And you all know that the energy is produced by the production of ATP in the body. And as the ATP breaks down, it leaves free ad adenosine. And that level rises through the day. Coffee promotes wakefulness because it's an adenosine receptor antagonist. This perhaps may be a little bit out of place, but it's a fascinating slide. And on the left, it shows the, a spider web, a normal spider web shown here. Uh, and it's a very intricate circular web uh, network. What's interesting about this is that if you look at the caffeine effect, if you feed these spiders caffeine, their ability to create a nice web is destroyed. Well, this is basically what happens to humans. Their ability to think and to plan and to do things properly is greatly affected, especially if they take caffeine. Uh, so when you th think of caffeine, be very careful about it because it does have its side effects. And we'll talk a little bit about how you get your caffeine fix every day. And here is the normal sleep pattern. This, I have alluded to this. This is a circadian rhythm. It's greatest at 7 in the morning, it rises. So in mid-morning, it's at the highest. Then through the day, it drops, so that by 11 o'clock at night, the uh, process C, the circadian rhythm, is at its lowest. You have a hard time staying awake. But by the next day, it gradually rises to fall in the same pattern. The other is by this accumulation of adenosine that I alluded to a minute ago. And this adenosine will gradually rise. It gradually increases so that by 11 o'clock, it's reached a point that you have a hard time staying asleep because of the accumulation of adenosine load in your body. And then it drops. And the adenosine during sleep, during the sleep hours, drops back down to a, a tolerable level. But it's during this time that you regain the normal function uh, to allow you to go through the next day. This vertical line here whoops, is a measure of the sleep drive. So that here you see, early in the morning, the sleep drive is fairly small, measured by the height of the vertical axis between the uh, circadium and the, um, the uh, process C, the sleep drive. But by 11 o'clock at night, that vertical axis is very, very high. So the drive is very great to get your sleep. It's hard to stay awake. But if you force yourself, if you have to stay up for 36 hours or you are studying for exams, then the normal sleep pattern occurs here. And this is when you should be going to sleep, but you take your caffeine, you force yourself to stay awake, you do what you can to stay awake. And so there's a, even a greater urge but then you have what is a second wind. You, you are a little bit more alert by 36 hours along because that's the time that the circadian wave takes over and it gives you that second wind. But by 12 hours after that, you're back to a point that you have an overpowering urge to sleep and you just can't keep yourself awake. So this is the danger that one faces. Now. If one looks at the sleep architecture, this is a very important thing because it differs between the young population and the older population. In the younger population, we, 
we, I, yes, uh, get to sleep uh, really much or somewhat more quickly. And you get into the uh, various ranges of the REM sleep, which is a very light level of sleep, and REM stands for rapid eye movement. And then you get into even deeper phases of sleep, which is the NREM, the non-REM phases. And it's during this phase that you really do develop the good patterns of, of sleep and learning and retaining function and learning for the next day. And you see that the young patient wakes up occasionally, but for the most part, he's in the REM sleep and the NREM sleep. But look what happens when you become older. It's a little bit longer to get to sleep. The NREM sleep is very sporadic. You get these phases of which you wake up. There's great fragmentation of your sleep during night so that you wake up several times. Look at this pattern. This is a polysomnography test, a, a sleep study that is done for patients that have a sleep problems. And this is the kind of thing that you pick out. So there's much less NREM sleep. You're in the superficial NREM one, but not into the deeper two and the threes, which is really necessary for retaining new information and developing new ideas. And then you get into this whole area of glymphatic flow, which I'll talk about in a moment. So this just summarizes what happens. Uh, the sleep patterns with aging, when one goes to sleep, there's this sundowning. People get sleepy a little bit earlier in the daytime. Uh, they wake up earlier in the morning. These older patients, especially if they have Alzheimer's disease, wake up in the middle of the night. They can't sleep. The sleep architecture is severely affected. And the biological clock sets uh, earlier and earlier. It takes longer to fall asleep, greater latency. And this sleep is more fragmented, as I showed in that polysomnography test. But one of the more fascinating areas of science that is really developed that explains perhaps the question of why we sleep, not just because we're tired, but there's a real scientific reason as to why we do sleep. And this whole concept of the glymphatic system is really very new. It's only been around for about six or seven years. As any of you that have studied anatomy, you were taught that the brain does not have a lymphatic system. They have arteries, they have veins, but no lymphatics. Well, about seven or eight years ago, this concept of a lymphatic system was developed. And I think somebody should win a Nobel Prize for this idea because it answers so many questions of why dementia occurs, why Parkinson's disease occurs. I'll simplify this to say that there is a flow of spinal fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, that passes through the brain. And while it passes through the brain, it enters on the left side here, and it passes through the brain and goes to the right side. And as this spinal fluid passes through the brain, it picks up molecules, it washes the brain out of bad molecules, hyperphosphorylated tau, beta amyloid, in Parkinson's disease, we know about the alpha-synuclein. So in the youth, these proteins are produced normally. The molecules are produced normally. The production of beta amyloid and hyperphosphorylated tau are normal functions of the brain. But in youth, it's washed out rapidly. The fascinating thing about this is that the glymphatic system washes out when you're asleep, it gets largely turned off when you're awake. So this washout of the bad toxic molecules of hyperphosphorylated tau, of beta amyloid, alpha synuclein, retain themselves. And so after years and years of, of staying awake, trying to shorten your, uh, your period of sleep at night, this problem gradually develops, so these molecules accumulate. And so you get into the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles that we know so well of in the patient that has Alzheimer's disease. And in Parkinson's disease, you get the accumulation of Lewy bodies, which are alpha-synuclein molecule accumulations. 
So it's fascinating. You know, I'm a neurosurgeon. You know, I was a macho guy when I went through training. We try to back down the amount of time that we would sleep at night. You know, sleep, I'll die and I'll sleep for eternity after that. That's when you really can sleep. I'm not going to do it in this life. You know, it's a waste of time. But you find out when you try to lower your sleep down to five hours and four and a half hours at night, the sky doesn't seem as blue. The grass doesn't seem as green. Things lose their texture. You really become a little bit more hazy, a bit more foggy. And that, of course, is what happens to people. You are foggy. You've got this accumulation of the toxic products in your brain, and you're accumulating these products, which over decades really will develop into Alzheimer's disease at 60 and 70 years of age. We in the group here don't feel that Alzheimer's disease is a disease of old age. It's a disease of middle age, in 30s and 40s, and the lifestyle changes, part of which Dr. Barbie has just spoken about with the diet, the sleep patterns, the exercise. How you if you have hypertension, how will you take care of that? If you have diabetes, how will you take care of that? These are all factors that, if they're not taken care of in the 30s and 40s, they accumulate year after year, decade after decade, so that by the time you're in the 60s and 70s, you've got this terrible disease of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. This is another slide that sh shows, once again, that this uh, glymphatic flow comes from the cerebrospinal fluid, passes through the brain, picks up these toxic molecules represented in black, then taken up into the venous system and washed out of the body. When you sleep, this glymphatic system is turned up by two times greater than it is during the daytime. So the sleep is critically important. And this slide just simply talks about the risk factors. Well, you can't help aging. This is that's just part of life, you age. But what you can do, if your sleep quality decreases, the glymphatic function decreases. If you have a sedentary lifestyle, if you have substance abuse, if you have sleep apnea, obesity, circadian management, depression, cardiovascular disorders, these all lead to a decrease in the glymphatic function. And of course, what does that lead to? Well, if your glymphatic function doesn't work, you have an increased aggregation of alpha uh, uh, or beta amyloid and tau. So they accumulate, leading to neuroinflammation that Dr. Barbary briefly spoke about the importance of preventing the inflammation by his tributrate. And then that, of course, leads to memory loss and dementia. So this glymphatic system is a central, plays a central role in the development of Alzheimer's disease. Well, what is the difference between sleep and the aged and youth? It's not as great as you might think. Uh, in fact, there's very little change. Uh, in fact, at the bottom of this slide, it shows that the incidence of insomnia in the aged is only one to seven percent. So there are other reasons that the aged patient does not sleep as well as the young patient. There are other chronic medical problems that may lead or aggravate insomnia, heart disease, pain from arthritis, lung problems, acid reflux, stroke, anxiety and depression, a big one. As you get older, you're anxious. You worry about things. Things start to bear in your mind. And that prevents sleep from occurring. Side effects of many drugs. And I've been impressed by being part of the dementia team we have here. I said, well, why don't you put everybody on Tenepacil, Aricept, and Nemantine? They say, no, no. The best bang for the buck is to look at the drugs these patients are on and decrease some of the drugs that are causing the memory problems. And there's just greater gain to be looked because physicians will add patients a new medication every year. A new symptom comes on, they add another drug. So that by the time you're 20 years down the road, you're on a whole page of drugs. But the memory group, Dr. Cooper and Dr. Hart, have really pointed out that the best way to treat these patients is to control the drug 
intake, the, the polypharmacy that these patients have. It's fascinating that it takes an 80-year-old only 10 minutes more than a 20-year-old to fall asleep. Well, who needs to be seen for insomnia? What, what are the guidelines for this? If your daytime is disrupted by drowsiness, you're falling asleep several times a day. You need to be seen for this. This is a problem. Your, your sleep at night is not healthy enough, and you need to be seen by a sleep specialist. You need to keep medical conditions under control, and you treat the insomnia. So many physicians put patients on Ambien and Lunesta, Sonata, Belsomera. These are the main uh, medications used to help people sleep, and it does help them get to sleep, and they stay asleep longer. But they're not meant to be taken for more than four to eight weeks. Many people are on these medications for months and years, and they have their deleterious side effects. What are the dangers of sleeping pills? Well, there are several that you can imagine. There are side effects of the sleeping pills, such as residual sleepiness during the day. You become dizziness, lightheaded, and that causes people to be unsteady when they walk and fall and fracture bones, their hips, and their get compression fractures of the spine. And this often leads to often a fatal condition in the patients that uh, have been put on sleeping pills to help them sleep, but the side effects may be fatal. Look at the interactions between sleeping pills and other drugs. It worsens, it worsens uh, obstructive sleep apnea and hypoventilation. And these medications uh, really overshadow uh, any benefit that might be attained from them, certainly in the cognitive and motor function. Well, look at non-drug treatments. If patients come to you and they are having sleep problems, how do you help them out? Well, look at the non-drug problems. For example, avoiding caffeine. The half-life of, half of caffeine is almost six hours, so that if you take 200 milligrams of caffeine at midday, at noon, you still got 100 milligrams of caffeine on board by 6 o'clock at night. So the half-life may be even greater if there's abnormal liver function. So you really have to think about the damaging effects of caffeine. The average caffeine that we take per day is 200 milligrams. But if you take between 4 and 500 milligrams a day, that causes adverse overdose symptoms. So the maximal safe dose, you can work that out, is about 6 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. To give you an idea of just what this consists of in the diet, that's over five shots of espresso. Many people wake up and they get awake and they take an espresso or a couple or three or four, or five eight ounce Red Bulls. Uh, you take, I don't know how many of you go to Starbucks and get a venti brewing coffee. I'm not sure what the volume of that is, but you just take one of those and you've had between 400 and 500 milligrams of caffeine. These monster energy drinks that the young kids drive, only two and a half of those. And Coke, you, it's, we thought to be bad, but you know, you really uh, can take almost 12 of those a day to come up with the four to, uh, 400 milligrams of caffeine. Another value of non-drug treatment is have the patients exercise more. Everybody says, well, you should exercise. Well, there are a lot of reasons to exercise, not just that you increases your energy, but it gives you a positive outlook. It controls weight. It puts you at a normal BMI range. It increases longevity, and we hope that by the research that Dr. Barve, who's going to be joining Norton very soon, and Dr. Whittemore, we're going to be able to look at the way that the weight and the lifestyle changes really helps people increase their longevity and decrease the chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. Exercise helps you sleep better. It releases the feel-good hormones, the endorphins. And the exercise doesn't have to be sort of a Arnold Schwarzenegger type of exercise. Just walking uh, for 20 minutes, 30 minutes a day for three to four days a week is quite adequate to uh, take care of the exercise program, especially in an older patient. Strength training is very valuable. Uh, even light weights, not heavy weights, but even 10-pound weights used on a regular basis will increase your ability to breathe and prevent that sarcopenia that was mentioned earlier. 
Some people try to do exercise, especially in a peloton. After a hard day's work, you get home at night and you sleep and you, you want to exercise to get your exercise in, but that may keep you awake. So it's better to do it in the late afternoon rather than waiting late in the day to do that. It's also important to set a daytime foundation. Food and foods, you have to be careful what you take in. I've mentioned the uh, caffeine uh, taken especially before night uh, because that, if you take a Mountain Dew or a Coke at 11 o'clock at night, you may be awake till three in the morning for that. And a large meal, even before bedtime, can increase the risk of digestive discomfort. Also, your daytime exposure to sun is very important. The lighter and the brighter makes one more alert and awake. The darker environment produces more melatonin. That increases the, uh, the uh, development of uh, sleep. Uh, the plenty of sunlight will synchronize that circadian uh, rhythm that I spoke about earlier. And if you want to go to sleep earlier, spend time in the sunlight during the afternoon. There are other sleep-friendly habits that one can learn. Uh, give the body the proper sleep signals when you get to sleep. These are things you all know about, but how many people practice what they've learned? It's pretty hard to follow all these rules, but going to bed at the same time every night, including holidays and weekends. Uh, this reinforces the body's sleep-wake cycle and taking a warm bath or a shower before night, reading a book, leading to music, and not turning on the TV and watching it, the late night show. That's gonna keep you awake longer and even watching uh, a TV screen and a, an iPad will keep you awake. So when you go to bed, go bed to bed to sleep. So don't just lie there and turn over. If you do that, get up and read, but don't eat and don't take more caffeine or watch TV. One has even looked at the uh, cognitive and behavioral therapists, and there's something to be learned in that. The cognitive therapy uh, changes the unhealthy thought processes to help people deal with the anxiety, which is one of the major causes of uh, main, uh, keeping awake. Keep a sleep journal. Uh, people have uh, learned that the sleep journals uh, what keeps you awake. Some people have even looked at the melatonin, and we have a big argument in our group about the value of melatonin. Uh, I think it's uh, somewhat of a placebo effect, but we have a couple of people in the group that think that it just, they just swear by it in the older population that it does have a, a great value. Keep a sleep score. Uh, that really is the amount of time that you're asleep in bed uh, versus over the time that you actually are in bed. And the sleep efficiency score should be really 90% or more. You should be spending time in bed to sleep, and if it gets below 85 and you're just tossing and turning for hours, that really is a danger and uh, one that we really uh, have to avoid, and you may need medical help to work out with that. So with that, I think I've given you an overview of some of the uh, benefits of sleep, some of the risks of not sleeping, and a little bit of the science of it as well. So I'm, I'm looking forward very much to having Dr. Whittemore and Dr. Barve join our group at Norton Healthcare in the dementia group and the Parkinson's group. And I think that you're gonna be hearing great scientific advances that come from our group in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.